Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Foul Grim. I finally figured out the only reason to be alive is to enjoy it. He that loves pleasure must to pleasure full. There was a point where this needed to stop and we've clearly passed it, but let's keep going and see what happens. That which causes us trials shall yield us triumph, and that which makes our hearts ache shall fill us with gladness. For the only true happiness is to learn, to advance and to improve. None of this could happen without rejecting error, ignorance and imperfection. We must pass out of the darkness to reach the light. Fulgrim, the Palatine Phoenix aka Prissy Little Bitch, Drama Queen, Obnoxious Brown Noser, every gay anime character stereotype, Snack Man, is the Primarch of the Emperor's Children Traitor Legion, a Demon Prince, the Pretty Boy of the Family, Perennial Handler of Extra Fucking Cursed Swords and an Enormous Hedonistic Bitch. Pre-Heresy, Fulgrim was the hottest goddamn asshole in the galaxy. Like, anime protagonist, Gary Stu self insert HAWT. Jury's still out on if he was hotter than Sanguinius. He was so HAWT, that his residual hotness made all of humanity the hottest race in the galaxy, which is kind of ironic, because foul means ugly in Swedish, and grim means ugly in Danish. Anyways, point is, Fulgrim was one handsome human. Because of this, he decided that all the ugly Xenos had to fucking die for the crime of not being HAWT humans. Fulgrim was also moody as hell, craving drama, and was generally the worst guy at parties. In fact, he was so edgy, that one time he met up with Perturabo to tell him he'd heard of some cool elder weapons they could use to kill daddy. They met on a remote planet to talk about it, and halfway through the first fucking sentence, Fulgrim decided that he couldn't just explain it out in the open. Rather, he felt he had to tell Perturabo in a magnificent amphitheater built into a beta or crater. Nothing else would do. Sadly, no such amphitheater existed in the galaxy at the time. No probs for Fulgrim, though, as he just made the Iron Warriors build one. Since there were no craters on this planet and no meteors available, better break out the explosives. Boom went the dynamite, and the erecting of this theater began, while Fulgrim broke out the deck chair and refused to move until his brother's legion raised said theater. When the theater was done, he finally took the stage and began prancing around, eventually getting to the point and starting his explanation. Unfortunately, he'd spent so much time dicking around that a cover tops raven guard had enough time to set up shop in the rafters and promptly shot Fulgrim through the head just as he was getting to the good part of the story. If Perturabo was anything other than a humorless emo fuckwood, he'd have felt some glee at seeing his time wasting, but still conscious brother describing the experience of getting a 9 inch titanium spike stuck in his brain after spending 10 minutes, cackling hysterically at the wasted effort. Despite all this, we should remember that Fulgrim was a pretty cool guy before he fell to chaos. He wasn't always prideful to a fault, and in fact, Many Primarchs were his friends. Pharos Manus, oh the irony, and Horus were both extremely close to Fulgrim, and Fulgrim was the only Primarch Conrad Kurz really trusted. He wasn't just handsome superficially, and actually had a decent sense of compassion, which the Imperium desperately needed at the time. Also, the past tense is necessary because Fulgrim's present circumstances seem to change way faster than GW has ever moved any plot, ever. He'd been a painting, a snake, a dude, possessed by a greater demon, and all kinds of shit. Fuck knows which if any of these actually were him, or just dickish slanishy demons taking the piss. No one knows fucking anything anymore. No, really. For a while his soul was literally stuck in a painting a la Dorian Gray, and a greater demon possessed his body, making him do some pretty fucked up things even by the standards of an Astartes following slanish, which is saying a lot. Fulgrim now has full control of his body again, or, at least that's what he says. Because Chaos has always been honest and trustworthy, am I right? Angren thinks that Fulgrim is an overpomped dandy and regularly pays his demon world visits, where he pummels Fulgrim's four-armed snake ass into a bloody pulp and generally makes a mockery of Slanesh in general. 
Also corn fanboys would have you believe, as they constantly rant on about how Angrim gets shit done. And conveniently ignore that, whilst Fulgrim has killed two fucking Primarchs killed one fucking Primarch. Though that is still a massive achievement. Killed a fucking Primarch and turned another into a vegetable for 10,000 fucking years. Not to mention dozens, if not hundreds of clones of Ferris made by Fabius Bile. Angron's Primarch body count currently stands at zero. Though of course, what Angron does kill at least stays fucking dead. Meanwhile, Fulgrim's Mark, Gilliman, came back to life as a fucking rejected Dota StarCraft character concept. To top it off, it's heavily implied that Gilliman managed to kill Fulgrim before his nap Gilliman got owned by Fulgrim before taking some warp dust and going into a coma. Some of the official lore cites this as a claim that Fulgrim was the best duelist amongst the Primarchs, but frankly, such a claim is laughable considering who his brothers are. If only they were around to dispute that claim. Anyway, Fulgrim is trapped crying in a painting while Anglin's mind is his own. So, yes, Slanish do indeed suck. Never mind he got out. Also, he got fucked in the ass by a medieval torture instrument in the latest Black Library book. This is canon. Not like he hadn't enjoyed it. He is the second Primarch to receive his own miniature as part of Forge World's character series. Surprisingly, it's not just a set piece. It's an actual miniature. Youth. Like his brother Primarchs. The infant Fulgrim was abducted by the four gods of chaos, who weren't really into the whole Primarch thing. Also, like his brother Primarchs, he was eventually thrown onto a planet of his own since the four gods found out that raising infant Primarchs really wasn't worth the trouble, especially when you can get some other suckers to do it for you. Fulgrim landed on the planet Chemis, whose people had been dependent on interstellar trade to make everything work. The warp storms caused by the birth of Slanesh made such trade impossible, meaning the planet didn't have the resources to sustain a large population. Art, culture, and recreation were sacrificed for the need to survive. By the time baby Fulgrim landed, the planet's resources had been so stretched that any orphan found was normally killed so as not to put further strain on the planet's dwindling resources. Indeed, the scouts that found him during a storm debated as to whether or not they should kill the infant. Unfortunately for the scout arguing for the death penalty, the infant Primarch was equipped with a little failsafe called adorable cuteness that made most people want to protect him. Those who found him named the infant Fulgrim in honor of one of the ancient gods of Chemus. He was raised by a Kimosian family, and eventually grew up to completely turn Chemus fortunes around. As with all the Primarchs. Fulgrim grew up at an unnatural rate. He started off differently from other Primarchs, as he wasn't a warrior, or a freedom fighter, or an object of worship, but a simple laborer in one of Chemist's many factories. Once working, he immediately showed talent in all things, improving machines to make them more efficient, working hours that would kill a normal human, and rediscovering new technologies that had been lost since the Dark Age of Technology. He improved Chemist's infrastructure so much that people actually began to have time for other things again. Most importantly of all, with Fulgrim came a will and a drive for Chemist's people to rise up above their level of merely existing and become something greater than drab factory workers struggling for survival. Perhaps the people of Chemist would never become great, but now they could reach for the stars once more. It was then that the Emperor arrived. As soon as Fulgrim saw the Emperor, he took a knee and swore fealty. What? No jokes about kneeling. This website has changed. The Emperor then showed Fulgrim his legion, now only 200 strong. It is said that upon seeing his sons displayed before him, entire companies reduced to only one start, yet still proudly bearing their banner, Fulgrim knelt. He then rose and addressed his sons, saying, You are the Emperor's chosen, his heralds, his warriors, his children, for this is only the beginning. Just as the people of Chemis were born again, so would the third legion's Astartes forge themselves into a new future under a new master. Terror. Despite the Great Crusade being well underway, Fulgrim and the Emperor went back to Terra to reunite Fulgrim with his legion. Why he didn't bring them along so they could get going is anybody's guess. When they finally reached Terra, Fulgrim was introduced to his legion and discovered that some accident had reduced the gene seeds of the III legion to the point that only 200 remained. 
Without the Primark, it had been a slow and laborious process of repairing the damage. But never let it be said that Fulgrim didn't know how to bounce back from any hit. As he met his legion he made the customary speech to his legion and named them the Emperor's children. The Emperor's already ginormous ego was pleased by this speech, so he allowed Fulgrim and his legion to use the Aquila as their symbol. Never let it be said that the Emperor doesn't reward those who strokes his ego pleasingly. As all other Primarchs, his legion quickly gave him a nickname. Since Fulgrim in their eyes had risen their legion from the ashes, Fulgrim got the name the Phoenician. As all other Primarchs, his brothers had a nickname for him too, since Fulgrim liked to dress in one outlandish costume after another, to the point that Lady Gaga would ask him to tone it down some, they named him Peacock. This name would also be used to describe the nature of his legion when not in battle. Just how long it took Fulgrim to get his legion back on track has been forgotten but Fulgrim's flagship was completed 160 years before the Horus Heresy, so he probably took some time as no Primarch wants to be seen dead without his flagship. Especially if the Primarch is the most vainglorious man ever to exist. Unfortunately for Fulgrim, the Emperor couldn't sit around and wait for Fulgrim to finish his work in bringing the Emperor's children back to full strength. So Fulgrim's legion were merged with Horus's lunar wolves until they were ready to go out on their own. As a side note, Fulgrim's flagship took twice as long to build as any other Gloriana class battleship ever had because he insisted on it being absolutely perfect. We don't know how long that was but more than likely it was quite a long while. Among Fulgrim's closest friends were Horus and Ferris Manus, whom he nicknamed the Gorgon and whom he shared a closer friendship with than the rest of his brothers despite the two of them being perhaps the most different of all the Primarchs in terms of interests and attitude. Their first meeting was on Terra beneath Mount Neorodnaya, the greatest forge of the Urals, where Ferris Manus was busy toiling with the forge masters who had once served the Tirot clan during the Unification War soon after his arrival from Medusa. The Primarch of the Iron Hands had been demonstrating his phenomenal skill and the miraculous powers of his liquid metal hands when Fulgrim, the Primarch of the III Legion, the Emperor's Children, and his elite Phoenix Guard, had descended upon the sprawling forge complex. Neither Primarchs had met each other before, but when they meet each other they immediately felt a kinship, either that or the fact that each of them were 3.5 meters tall, one a regal looking albino and the other a muscular strongman with living metal all over his hands and that all artisans in the room immediately prostrated themselves in front of them, might have been a pretty huge clue. That said, Faris' conversations with Log tended to run to about half a minute, and that was only if Faris couldn't help it, so maybe there is something in that story. When Ferris Manus later told of what had happened beneath Mount Neorodnaya, he said that Fulgrim had come claiming that he had come to forge the most perfect weapon ever created for the Great Crusade. Ferris Manus, ever prideful, could not let such boast go unchallenged. If he had been less prideful, he might have been a head taller than he is today, not to mention alive. Laughing in Fulgrim's face, Ferris Manus answered Fulgrim's boast by declaring that such pansy hands as Fulgrim's could never forge anything. Fulgrim accepted the challenge with regal grace and both Primarchs stripped to the waist, making every female and male, who bent that way Primarch abs do not give a shit about your sexuality, artisans wound in pleasure. For three months the Primarchs worked unceasingly at the forge until at last their weapons were complete. Fulgrim had forged an exquisite Warhammer, forger breaker, that could level a mountain with a single blow, and Ferris Manus a golden bladed sword, fire blade, that forever burned with the fire of the forge. Well never let it be said that both Primarchs didn't appreciate fine craftsmanship, Fulgrim declared that fire blade equal of that borne by the legendary hero Nuada Silverhand and Ferris swore that only the mighty thunder gods of Nordic legend were fit to bear such a magnificent Warhammer. Without a word the two exchanged weapons, unknown at the time was the fact that Fulgrim would later use Forgebreaker to beat Ferris to a bloody pulp when Ferris stubbornly refused to join Horus's rebellion. It was after the whole affair beneath Mount Narodnaya that Fulgrim came up with Ferris's nickname. Arriving at the Imperial Palace, Sanguinius of the Blood Angels had arrived bearing gifts from his home world of Baal. Exquisite statues from the glowing rock of Baal. Priceless gemstones and wondrous artifacts of aragonite, opal, and tourmaline. 
the Lord of the Blood Angels had brought enough to fill a dozen wings of the palace with the greatest wonders imaginable. Apparently Sanguinius tried to imitate Fulgrim's trick of stroking the Emperor's ego. Fulgrim was ecstatic over the wonders Sanguinius had brought, but Ferris Manus had little time for such things and declared that such frivolities were a waste of time when there was still a galaxy out there to conquer. Fulgrim jokingly answered this by saying that Ferris was a terrible old gorgon. The nickname stuck and word had it that Ferris became quite fond of the nickname, considering that his legion terminators were called gorgon terminators and had unique gorgon pattern armor. He must have. Might have had something to do with his own legion calling him the Medusan. That to the fact his homeworld is called Medusa. GW subtlety strikes again. These anecdotes notwithstanding, Fulgrim couldn't hang around Terra all day and having already been merged with the Lunar Wolves, they quickly set off on the Great Crusade along with Horus. Great Crusade. Fulgrim's quest for perfection began as a need to live up to the honors bestowed upon his legion, the only legion to bear the Emperor's own heraldry as its symbol. In his eyes they were a legion apart, set above their brothers by the Emperor's own hand. Indeed it is true that the Emperor's children perhaps could not practice attrition warfare as well as the Iron Warriors, or drop assault as well as the Blood Angels, or fleet engagements as well as the Imperial Fists, instead taking a jack of all trades approach, and most importantly possessing within them the will and drive to become paragons in all things. Fulgrim saw in his children what the Emperor meant for space marines to be, not only experts at war and carnage, but noble, strong and excelling in all matters. Because of this the Emperor's children were noted to place an emphasis on artistic matters and physical appearance, values that to other Astartes seemed vainglorious. By the time Robout Gilliman had been discovered, Fulgrim was still campaigning alongside Horus and had yet to strike out independently. It seemed that there was some resistance against the Emperor's children leaving for the Great Crusade, firstly from his brothers who felt that the Legion had not properly recovered from the genetic degradation that had reduced them to only 200 Marines. For Fulgrim's part he hated this as a form of pity and felt that his Legion was being underutilized, resenting that resources were being diverted to Legions which already had strong battle records. Secondly, the courts of Terror had originally felt that the Emperor's children, being largely of noble stock, were one of the most internally cooperative legions when they required military agents and had reservations against losing such troops to a different commander, even if it was their own gene father, so Malkada sent his agents into Fulgrim's new expeditionary fleet to keep tabs on him. Fulgrim's first fully independent action was to bring compliance to the feudal world of Byzus with only seven marines. Arguing where if Lemon Russ could conquer a world with only 800 men, and Horus could do it with 80, then Fulgrim would do it with 8, including himself. Such a perfect victory would silence the criticisms of his brothers and his detractors at court. When he landed on Byzus, the hereditary governor of the planet was only too happy to agree to compliance, although they would first have to deal with the various factions of rebels among the nobility as well as the secret societies and revolutionaries throughout the populace. No less than 10 different factions attempted to poison Fulgrim on his very first day of arrival, something he considered very rude, so Fulgrim set himself the goal of achieving compliance within one month. Although the world could not match the Astartes physically or technologically they did have a comparatively advanced form of swordsmanship and philosophy regarding the search for perfection. Even so he could not otherwise hope to wage war against so many factions with only 8 men and set about uniting all of the factions against him for the sake of efficiency, even where some more sensible factions wanted to ally themselves with him, presenting a unified front for him to behead and successfully bringing the world to compliance on time, while incorporating the world's primitive fundamentals of swordplay and philosophy into his own ideals of perfection. As the Great Crusade went on, Fulgrim's focus on perfection became an obsession. It began to alienate their fellow Astartes as more egotistical legionaries like Eidolon ascended up the command chain. During one campaign, Horus came close to rebuking Fulgrim personally for the problems his officer caused. It's likely that this started when he found the infamous Blade of the Lair, which was more or less responsible for everything going wrong for the III'd, and by extension the XTH, as it was inhabited by what is assumed to be a keeper of secrets. Anyways. The corruption's effects were subtle at first, 
But eventually a lot of Fulgrim's restraint vanished, and he became a pretty huge dick. Also, he became convinced that he'd have to go beyond the Emperor's work to reach perfection. He felt this way because of the blight that his legion suffered, leading to him approving of Fabius Bile's experiments. You can guess what that led to. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Naturally, ugly ass Mortarian hated Fulgrim and his vanity, seems he fantasized about Fulgrim's finery rotting away in the fumes of Barbarus. Jagatay didn't have much time for Fulgrim's boasting about his swordsmanship either and told him during a post a meeting that you have your prowess, but I would leave you choking on it. Fulgrim at the time did not take particularly well to this, though later he would have found this promise strangely arousing. Interestingly, the Khan also made some revealing comparisons of Sanguinius and Fulgrim, though he kept these observations to himself. While both Primarchs were absolutely resplendent, the Khan noted that Sanguinius seemed to be born to such splendor and made it look natural, while Fulgrim looked like a bit of a tryhard, and that while Sanguinius seemed willing to cast aside his finery in a heartbeat, Fulgrim would rather die. The Khan was also of the opinion that Fulgrim could be irritatingly stupid at times. So clearly not the best of buds. One incident of note was with the Primarch Conrad Curse of the Night Lords. Fulgrim tutored Kurz and was the only Primarch the Night Haunter really trusted or confided in, due likely in no small part to the fact that Fulgrim was the only Primarch Kurz had met on Nostramo who he didn't see dying horribly in his visions. During one campaign alongside the Imperial Fists, Kurz had one of the violent fits of future seeing that he was prone to, and Fulgrim rushed to his aid. Kurz told him of visions he had of death at the hands of his father, the Emperor and Primarchs fighting one another. Fulgrim was, understandably, deeply troubled by this, and decided to confide in Rogel Dawn, well known for his cool head and fairness. In the end though, it turned out to be a mistake as Dawn reacted badly to Kurz's visions. Angered by the very idea that someone would have visions of the Emperor killing one of his sons, he confronted Kurz. We don't know what exactly he said to him, but we do know a Dawn was brutally honest and b, that it caused Kurz to freak out, attack him and then flee. This little incident helped bring about the fall of the Night Lord's Legion, but how far it was Fulgrim's, Dawn's, or Kurz's responsibility is largely due to Conrad's absence from Nostramo resulting in his whole legion becoming staffed by murderers, criminals, and other scum, the very people he so loathed. This being said, Fulgrim should either have kept his mouth shut or found someone less inflexible than Rogel Dawn to try and help Conrad. Horus Heresy. Old law says that during the heresy, Fulgrim tried to persuade Horus to quit his bullshit, but then Horus somehow managed to coerce Fulgrim into joining him, using decadent pastimes. Most far TGUYS suspect it was a promise of untold amounts of drugs and butt sex. Black Library would con modify this. The reason Fulgrim turned was because of the demon sword he found on Laia, which he became corrupted by. Ironically enough, Laia had been purged of a slanish worshipping Xenos race before this. Then again, they didn't know it at the time, so, maybe this is Slanesh's former poetic payback. Or maybe, s, he is just a clever, whoa, man. Seeking eternal peace from unknowingly murdering his best friend and brother, Pharos Manus. Fulgrim sacrificed his soul to the demon inhabiting that sword. The demon possessing the sword said sweet nothings into Fulgrim's ear, promising it would ease his pain. So, let's recap. This sword was talking to Fulgrim in his head, claimed it could do the unthinkable, and was promising not to fuck him over. So obviously he had to trust it. Anyways, Fulgrim gets his soul squashed, paintings get haunted, corpses get implicitly buggered. Virgins are featured on D, drugs are taken, 
Blood is spilled. Noise is made. Slanesh's nipple. S. Get hard. Etc. On an interesting note, Horus promises to save his brother from his fate, which is insane, since he just spent all day fucking over everyone else. Fulgrim claims to have exorcised the demon from himself, however, he was later forced to admit that he was lying when Lorga threatened to expose his possession to the other traitor legions. Since then, he actually has exorcised the demon, and duped Per Cherabo into helping him become a demon prince himself. What a twist. After that, Fulgrim only showed up when Horus bothered to summon him. In the meantime he was probably screwing with Slanesh, or his her legion, or whatever. All the drugs were probably involved. His first appearance after becoming a demon prince was in the battle of Dwellwehi, Horus, and Mortarion fought against the forces of the Iron Hands, who were still pissed about Fulgrim beheading their Primarch, proving that they couldn't just let bygones be bygones. In addition, 58 Imperial Legions, not those Legions, the Salamanders, and the White Scars. After having kicked the Loyalist forces collective ass and sending them skulking off, the Iron Hands commander Shadrach Medicine tried to assassinate Mortarion and Fulgrim by ambushing them in their ship with five fire raptors. Lo and behold, they failed and ran off again, and just to show that even Black Library doesn't know the meaning of OP, Fulgrim used his psychic powers to destroy one of the loyalists crafts before it could escape. Yeah, next time, we LL probably have Magnus the Red perform party tricks by juggling flagships with both hands tied behind his back. Seriously why does Black Library keep trying to build suspense by having people try to assassinate the traitor Primarchs when we know they don't die? Yet, so obviously we already know the outcome of the attempt. Next time, Fulgrim disguised himself as some serpent god of the night house of Devine in order to corrupt them. Sure, why not? Makes as much sense as anything else. Horus Heresy updates are sure to come later. As with everything else in this goddamn article. After Molech, Fulgrim disappeared again, to the point that Eidolon was basically running the EC's operations, with only a third of the Legion and a sudden competence. Seriously, read Path of Heaven. He's finally a believable commander, corrupt as he is. Comma Horus didn't have a clue where Fulgrim was, or what he was up to, and those Emperor's children who hadn't gone totally crazy had to admit that the warp-infused, megalomaniac warmaster now cared about them more than their own dad. During the Siege of Terror Rogaldorn kicked Fulgrim's demonic ass hard enough that even if he couldn't die, Fulgrim was hurt so bad he Raja quit the entire siege, abandoning his legion to get mauled by an embarrassingly small force of Imperial Fists. Or at least, that's what the Imperials want you to think. In reality, he mostly just fucked around, platonically, with Dawn in his pre-snake form for a while before Dawn stabbed him. At which point, Fulgrim instantly healed the wound but then got bored and left to go on a murder orgy amongst Terra's civvies. TL. DR. Fulgrim sword fucked him in the ass, this makes him asinine, especially considering the fact that he used it to kill his best friend. A man who could punch weapons into existence with his bare, metal, hands. Despite because everything about him screams flaming homo and or anime character, he's literally Dio Brando. He did get shit done in the heresy post heresy killing two other Primarchs, which is pretty badass. In fact, we all should be grateful he put Grandaddy Smurf in stasis because he would have likely run off into the eye of terror never to return like half the other other surviving loyalist Primarchs. On that note, it's time to talk about the big battle. What we know is, the battle was in real space and both Primarchs had a retinue of their best marines. Fulgrim managed to outmaneuver everyone's favorite spiritual legion separate Gilliman from his retinue with a giant black cloud. By the time the ultramarines finally found Gilliman through the smog, the loyalist Primarch was bleeding on the floor. Kinky. Many sons of Gilliman sacrificed their lives fighting Fulgrim to buy enough time to evacuate their Primarch. Grandpa Smurf is what again? In the closing years of the 41st millennium, the combined force of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Elder have magically brought Rob out Gilliman out of stasis. The blue giant is now stretching his limbs and restraining himself from smashing his face against the wall over the state of the Imperium. Suffice to say, news spread fast and eventually reached the demon Primarchs. 
Fulgrim was shown to be, surprise. Comma quite alive, and to say he was but fit overhearing the revelation that Big Bobby Blue is up and about, possibly giving him the troll face is a colossal understatement. Not to mention he was the first to actually attack the Big Blue in front of a crowd, who were celebrating his return and most recent victory. Knowing that Slanesh is alive, Gilliman could never again enjoy something without having to fear the powers of chaos were trying to corrupt him. Dang that must suck. Or, suck. According to the fracture of Bealtan, he was allegedly spotted outside the Eye of Terror for the first time in 10,000 years when the Emperor's children assaulted the Imperial mining world of Extrema 6, wherein they slaughtered everything. Expect more to follow, because now that Primarchs are fair game. It's hard to imagine GW passing up the chance to make a giant multi-armed serpent demon Primarch, especially the one that turned Papa Smurf into a vegetable. Impatient gamers can now kit bash, at very high cost, the new Morithi model to get close to the effect. Another piece of lore from the Phoenix Rising book states that a giant, snake-bodied, three-sword wielding, Whip-handed Mathefica is leading a traitor host known as the Grand Cacophony and slaughtering Imperial Guard and Elder alike. And now in Faith and Fury we have another tease of our favorite snacker boy. Some Emperor's children topple a planet called the Heatherith and say that the Illuminator is coming. Yeah it's pretty on the nose about who they're referring to. Also, Fulgrim went to Istvanii II after a sonic beacon caught his attention. There, he met the last loyal Emperor's children the ancient dreadnought Rylana, alongside some thousand sons. Rylana revealed he prepared a special fuck you for Fulgrim, Horus Heresy era virus bomb, which he detonated. Boo at a thousand sons sicker named Akhtar contained the blast, while Fulgrim opened up the dreadnought like a can of peaches, and offered Rylana a chance to become like him, but Rylana told Fulgrim to shove it up his scaly ass. Another thousand sons, Vistorio, impressed by Rylana's massive balls in front of Fulgrim and not wishing to see Rylana become Fulgrim's personal flashlight, pulled up his bolt pistol and capped Akhtar. The life eater virus was free and consumed Istvan III and everyone there. Snaky boy Fulgrim survived, but his pride was wounded. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.